Welcome to another Writing Gals discussion thing we do. <laughs> I'm Victorine and Michelle and Amy are wait, over that way. And Laura Burton is our guest again today and she's here with us. And today we're discussing craft and specifically answering questions about craft from new writers or seasoned writers. I mean, we all have questions about craft sometimes. So we'll be talking about craft, but, but first, before we jump into that, we're going to talk about what we've been up to. So we'll start with Michelle. I have been getting writing done in my Kindle Bella episode, and it's so much fun writing about vampires. I finally used the B word. <laughs> yeah, vampires. In case anyone's like, what? Because, you know, you got to keep the secret for a while. Anyway, um, it's kind of like in, in um, Twilight where Edward goes, say it. <laughs> so, like, it's I a got moment, to, right? It's a moment. I finally got to the B moment. <laughs> so that was a lot of fun. And um, actually, that vampire story got on the featured list for Kindle Bella. So it's been showing up and it's really made a big difference in the visibility for my story. Been seeing a lot more reads. I mean, like a, a lot, lot. Yeah. And, likes. and my book was hanging out at the very bottom of the top 250 list. And now it's at like 85. So I'm really excited about that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, everybody knows, like these ladies know, I have been watching a drama that um, I've been waiting for for six months. And if you want to talk about filling your bucket and being super inspired, oh my gosh, <laughs> it's this new drama about like, it's like called the Republican area era in China, but it's like the 1920s, 1930s, the hairstyles, the costumes, the architecture, all of the scene, like, like backdrop scene uh -huh. setting stuff is just there's already been a tango oh my god <laughs> and is it all out at once or is it no just i'm glad well, i've only been able to see two episodes because of the platform i'm watching it on and the chemistry is off the freaking charts so i'm like so ready to write again i'm That's super awesome. excited all right you want to go with her while we're unmuted yep. over here go ahead amy so I'm here because there was ice this morning and my kids all are home again, like they were last week and that worked really well. So I told my <laughs> I am going to go to Michelle's house so that I'm not constantly being just like knock and they don't knock, they like tap on the glass, you know, and I'm like, I am in here. Whatever your problem is, you have a, you have a parent to deal with you. So, um, anyway, hold on a sec. Why don't you go to Laura? Cause this is my bank. Okay. <laughs> Laura, what have you been up to? Well, I've written a whole 4,000 words this week. Nice. <laughs> you know, yes, I'm going to celebrate it, but <laughs> that's very low for me. Since yeah. having COVID, I don't know what's happened to my brain. It's like it's not working the same. I'm finding it very hard. So I'm getting there. I'm getting there. And I've gone into way too many rabbit holes this week. So now this next week I'm working on self-development and looking at my bad habits because <laughs> I keep going in these, like where I'm like, I'm gonna learn everything there is to know about attraction marketing or everything there is to know about blurb writing or whatever shiny ball there is out there. I'm just on it. And then I forget about all the other stuff I'm supposed to do. <laughs> so that's it I really. That. <laughs> I get that. I didn't even have COVID and my brain doesn't wanna write this week. <laughs> I think I've written a chapter and a half. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to finish this short 15,000 word novella and it is killing me, guys. <laughs> I, I, think I'm, I think I'm at like, um, uh, maybe, oh, what was I at last week? 12,000. I think I'm at 500 more words than that. I wrote more, but I chopped a bunch off. <laughs> So I I'm I feel like I'm treading at the same place and not getting forward. <laughs> out curse. I hate it. Yeah. So anyway, eventually I will get back to my Kindle Bella story, which I really want to get back to. It's that shiny thing in the distance that I'm like, I really want to write that. So I will finish this novella, I promise, and get back to my fun Kindle Bella story. So that's what I've been doing. 
All right, we're going to jump into these questions because we have a bunch of them. And each question is like a class in of itself. So, <laughs> so we're going to kind of touch lightly on these. We're not going to dive deep into them. Um, but we are planning on a Writing Gals Academy course for new authors and all about craft, all about writing and um, marketing for new authors and all of that stuff. Um, so we will dive deep into each one of these in our craft classes. Um, that is our plan for the future. So we will make it happen. We promise. <laughs> but question number one is, how do you end a story in a satisfying way? Do I get to and go first? You get to go first. You taught a whole class on this. <laughs> I hear Amy in the background. I'm not sure, but... I it, hopefully my mic is not that good. Okay. Yeah. I did teach a whole class on how to write um, an ending that will make your reader buy the next book was this topic of my class. But the four big points, the bullet points I want to bring out today is number one, answer all your story questions. Be sure right. that whatever questions you drop for your reader, you have answered by the last page. Um, the second one is to create the emotions um, by the end of that story that the reader was expecting and wanting when they purchased it. So that's part of your promises that you've made as an author. Make sure that you have promised this certain experience and then you've delivered it emotionally. So if you started out writing a romance, be sure that they get to those happy, warm, swoony, fuzzy bubbles by the end of the book, right? Bubbles. <laughs> yeah, that's like bubbly, like, Whoa! Warm, fuzzy bubbles. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's where you want to get them to. Um, the third one is make sure if you, like, this is higher level, but this is what I aim for. Um, make sure the reader walks away with a deeper connection with the universe or, or mankind or, like, all of humanity. And that's sort of, like, where your theme comes into it really heavily um it's it's that um truth that's what theme is theme is a truth and so be sure that in the course of writing your story that you have brought them on a journey to discovering some truth about life the universe the world we live in that resonates with them and that they feel like they've um been able to get gain something from this time investment besides just the entertainment factor and then my fourth bullet point is you want them to have a high opinion of you as an author. And that sounds like a really big job. But to me, like one of the most satisfying things is that feeling of like, wow, this author just took me on exactly the journey I wanted to go on. And now I trust them to go on another one with them. And to do that, I really like to have things that make them feel like I know what I'm doing and that all of this wasn't an accident. And I do that by having circular endings where the beginning somehow mirror or the end somehow mirrors the beginning. I like to have a lot of foreshadowing that they get all that they realize was foreshadowing by the end of the book, um, that they feel really connected to my characters. And like I said, that while we have delivered on the expectations that because we're such a good author, we've also surprised them by the end of the book. So those are the, the things I try to use to make them feel like I know what I'm doing and they can trust me as an author. And so they walk away with this really good experience and they feel like this was a good ending. I'm feeling all the positive feelings, even if they're crying and because of tragedy at the end of it. And then they'll turn around and look for my next book. So that's all I have to say. And I'm going to be quiet now. Perfect. That was awesome. Any other comments, Amy or Laura? Yep, me. Laura, <laughs> go ahead. Okay. This is coming from a don't be like Laura. I feel like I could do a whole series on don't be like me. Um, <laughs> I, in my early books, well, I say early books, like the first 10, <laughs> I wrote and published. I kept getting these reviews. A lot of people obviously are nice and say, loved it, it was great. But there were a few that would say, it was really great till the end. And it's like, uh oh. <laughs> 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 endings. And a lot of people were saying the same thing. They said it was too rushed. And this is something I see a lot in, you know, in other books and that. And so I had to really dive in and I spoke to a couple of writer friends 
and I had a developmental editor looking over and I realized I was missing some beats and it was totally my fault. Like I actually did it on purpose. So if you watch a romantic comedy and there's always a bit where there's a breakup and a sad montage and then they have some, you know, aha moment and then a resolution and they get back together with an apology or whatever, right? I hate that bit. <laughs> like, as someone watching <laughs> a movie, I'm like, oh, for goodness sake, I just want to forward to the apology and the big get back together. So my sort of like little montage bit where they're going through these emotions and really in turmoil, it'd be like a page and a half. <laughs> <laughs> but like they were so sad they were very sad they were they were so sad that they decided it was silly to be sad so they decided <laughs> to apologize and just get back together <laughs> so, so my tip for not rushing your endings is pay attention to those beats even mm -hmm. if you really want to skip them or rush them don't let them pan out because even though those parts are quite sour on their own when you put it in that neat little package of your book the ending is so much more satisfying so if you're getting any reviews like me it might be that you're just not staying in that dark moment long enough mm. good good um suggestion very good um for me for i found i was um, not wanting that very last epilogue on the end of my books. And so I would end it with just the, the happily ever after, after they get back together and, and make up and everything's all happy. And I, I ended my first book that way. And people would say, oh, the ending, I just didn't feel like it was satisfying. And I realized it needed that last, okay, now we have to show them happy together in their new life. And I realized that was an important part of romance is showing them together in their new life. So I never skip that now. So that is um, one important thing. I, another tip I have is, sorry, I, I, you guys keep unmuting. <laughs> another tip I have is I always read the entire thing before I write that last um, scene because <laughs> me and my writer brain, I always add in little things as I go and then I forget them. <laughs> So I'm like, oh, I got to tie up what happened to Jane and, and she went to jail. I got to tie that up, you know, and and little things that happen throughout the book that I do that I stick in there that I forget about. So I always read the entire thing before I write that last scene so I can tie up all loose ends. Yeah, don't leave Jane in jail. No, don't leave Jane in jail. Don't do it. Okay. Oh, OK. So don't mind me because I am I only had Lynn, 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 Lynn truffle balls for breakfast so I'm <laughs> starving so I'm like eating while we do this and literally my bank I thought it was this big deal but it was just my address I needed to update and the woman was like taking forever to talk and I was like lady I'm starving I really want to move you right now <laughs> Anyway, call people at lunchtime. Okay. Yeah. Well, it is not. It's like two o'clock. <laughs> man, what? I'm like, geez, I don't care about my address. Um, so I would think too well, the endings are bad when you have lost the tension in your story. So you need to make sure that your tension holds true. There has been books that I have read where I'm reading it and I'm like three fourths of the way through, and I can't remember why they can't be together. Um, and then the ending was like, well, we made this commitment, excuse me, to fake date. So we're just going to end it. And it just was like, mm, no, going to go no on that one. Um, and the other thing is where you haven't like foreshadowed something at the ending. And I read a book too, where I was like, like three, two pages before the end, all of a sudden they're like, oh no, now this thing happens. And then cliffhanger ending. And you were like, wait, what? Like, no, what? That doesn't make any sense whatsoever about what you just, it just feels like now all of a sudden you've created this thing and Michelle's cats are very interested in my food. <laughs> I will fight them to the death. <laughs> to have like World War Three going on in my kitchen table. Anyway, then you'd be like, Amy, if you're so hungry, stop talking. Um, so that was the only one where it just didn't feel like, it felt like she, the, this author was trying to push something that wasn't working or didn't foreshadow it. So be very careful with that, especially if you're going to leave things on a cliffhanger. People people want to know. They don't want to be suddenly surprised. Yes. <laughs> Let me call Ethan. 
<laughs> All right. This next question is akin to this one. It's how to write a great beginning that hooks the reader. So we've talked about endings. Now we're going to switch and talk about talk about beginnings. What do you think is a really good um, tips for good beginnings? Okay. You have to have a strong hook. Everybody knows that, but like, what is a strong hook? So a strong hook is something that makes the reader decide, okay, this is worth my time. I'm in it. I have to know the answer. A hook is actually a really powerful question that they have to know the answer to, right? You have to plant some crazy, compelling question in the reader's mind where they have to know the answer or they have to know what happens, okay? Now, we could have a whole class on how, like multiple classes, I think, on how to create strong story hooks, Corey Stokes. <laughs> <laughs> you do those too. But I mean, next year or this year in the writing golf conference, how to write strong Corey sucks. <laughs> so anyway, I recommend that you figure out how to write a good story hook. We can't. Did I say it right that time? You did. Okay, good. I think you did. I don't know. Write a good one. Also. Like, get them connected and invested. I'm going to teach you how. Just write a good one. Yeah. <laughs> how, like, that, just understand that a hook is a question, right? It makes you want to be there. If, if it's just about some, like, boring day and nothing is on and you don't care what happens next, then like that waking is, up is not a hook. No. Waking up and, and wondering if you're going to get a promotion is not even a hook. I guess that clarifies what I want to say. It's not about a goal, okay? A story hook is not about your character's goal and them really hoping something will happen. So the reader's like, oh, will they get their promotion when they get to work today? No, that's not the story hook. The story hook is introducing the conflict in a strong enough way that you put extreme doubt in the reader's mind or you wonder what in the world... Um, they're actually going to do about this other problem that just came up. Does that make sense? Like conflict is a major part of, of planting that question in the reader's mind. So you have to introduce conflict to hook yeah. your readers. So I it's agree. a combination of what the, what the character wants really badly <clears throat> and what's going to stop them from getting it. It can also have this other element of like, the actual story goal because what the character starts out wanting is probably not what they're going to be chasing the whole book so like we could talk about that more in further questions my other points are get them connected and invested in your characters and you do that by finding a way to make them care about that character really fast or at least um want to see what happens to them mm -hmm. not all characters start out likable um you also need to present multiple questions, not just your main story question or your big hook, because stories that in, like get your readers hooked into it are stories that keep them looking for clues. It's stories are mysteries. We might think that we're writing romances, but we're all writing mysteries and we're planting clues around the way. If you're just hand feeding everything easily to your reader, they're going to be bored. So the, process of writing a story is presenting them with questions even if they don't recognize it themselves so that they keep looking for those clues and answers and that keeps them turning the pages and that gets them interested in going forward and then my fourth point is to make it active right so you want to keep your descriptions and your backstory to a bare minimum and we're going to talk about how to do that a little bit later and you also want to just keep things moving you don't want them sitting around doing boring daily things. You want something compelling and actively happening from the get-go. Boom. There you go. But don't start it where they're in the middle of a an explosion. plane that's going down. Because no. nobody knows what, if I was to read that, I'd be like, okay, these are not the main characters because they're about to die. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. that's so. why that's why you say active beginnings, not like explosion beginnings. Yeah. Yeah. It just something has to be happening. And I would say too, like, no, 
no, you can't, you can't start too early. You can't start too late. So if you, an uh, indicator that you started too late is you have to give a bunch of backstory. You don't want to, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you, if, if you have to, re, you have to like, like go back in paragraphs and paragraphs to explain what happened, you probably started too late or you might need a prologue and then you don't have to fill in all that information too early. It would be, can you take this chapter out and no one would care. Mm -hmm. So, um, or half of the chapter and no one would care, which is the nice thing about romance is it's really the meat cute. Like that's when you start the story. Um, I, I'm a fan of the first chapter, the end having have met already. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some that, that doesn't happen. Like my women's fiction that doesn't really happen, but yeah, by the end you should have like the, okay, we have uh, assessed this problem and now I'm off to start, you know, battling the first war, but the whole, you know, but the whole story has doesn't necessarily have to start, but you have to give your, you know, it's Frodo leaving the Shire. You know, you kind of get established with characters and then, you know, OK, he needs to get to this point mm -hmm. next. So that's kind of what your first chapter or two um, establishes. Mm -hmm. Good. What are your thoughts, Laura? Well, I know what makes a bad beginning. And actually thinking about the way <laughs> um, part. Um, I think it works better in film, like TV, someone waking up because I can, I was getting like walking dead vibes, like Andrew Lincoln waking up in the hospital and there's just zombies everywhere <laughs> or not when Jack, is his name Jack, wakes up on an island and there's been a plane crash. Um, although I did read a book recently, it was an alien romance, which I don't normally read, but it was very good. Um, somebody just woke up on an alien spaceship and was told by somebody that if you don't agree to our orders, like this device on your neck is going to explode. And I was just like, oh, <laughs> I have to read this book. <laughs> so I think it's like, you can break the rules sometimes. You can have them wake up, but you've got to be in the middle of action and start like getting the people asking questions. Like the readers are going to be like, where are they? What's going on? Who's that? What's going on? You know, and I think you can get away with a lot more when you write in a way. I think there's different reader experiences, but when you write in a way where the reader is, so like when I read Harry Potter, I was Harry Potter, if that makes sense. Like mm -hmm. everything that happened to Harry, it was just, no, it was me. <laughs> like it wasn't yeah. really Harry, it was Laura. <laughs> um, I think for a good beginning, because I, I, because I think I'm dyslexic. I struggle a bit with words and stuff. I really love it when I'm reading and the words just disappear and I don't have to be thinking about what they're saying. And it's just this mini movie in my head. So then I think, well, what are the things that pull you out of the book that stop that little movie from happening? And it's usually things like backstory and um, lots of like filler or things that just doesn't make sense in the moment. Like, I read one book where someone just went on a big tangent about politics and it was like a romance. <laughs> so it was mm -hmm. like, oh, <laughs> you know, or sometimes. So I feel like you need to be in the action, very concise. And um, I prefer the method where you pepper in backstory rather than have big chunks, where it's just literally like a line or two. And then later on, it'll be a line or two because. I, I've tried reading some books where they're like, he put his jacket on his, like, on the thing. And then it reminded him of the days of yore when the blah, 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 blah. And I'm just like, oh, my goodness. It's, it's, <laughs> um, um, not not J.R. Tolkien. Who was the guy who wrote about the, the lion? The lion, the witch, and the oh. grass. Yes, Lewis. Yes, I yes. to read those. Oh, my gosh. My husband was reading them to my kids and he was like, I'm dying. I, it's like pages of like how the, the snow looks and the trees yeah. and all these other things. And he's just like, I can't. You I can't can get away with that in fantasy <laughs> though. And it's worse yeah. than Tolkien's. And he broke the rule about the endings because Michelle was saying, you need to feel good even though you're upset. Because I was 12, I finished Return of the King and I walked into my kitchen and I threw this book across the room. It sailed through the air and it fell right <laughs> into the trash. And I said to my mum, I hate that author. I was so angry, which he was a genius because he made a 12 year old feel emotions. 
I didn't even know I had. Um, but yeah, he broke the rules. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a, lot of what, a lot of what we're kind of talking about is really meant for the modern reader. Because as we think yeah. about like Jane Austen and we think about, um, you know, Charlotte Bronte and we and Charles Dickens and all of these writers from the past who were geniuses and are still enjoyed by a lot of people today. <clears throat> there's a completely different writing style. Do you think because maybe they didn't have movies? So like yeah. I yes. experienced what it's like to go to New York because I've seen a movie. And so if somebody says this is in New York, That's I don't a huge want part of it. all of the extra of interesting huh. but there's another part of it too back then all they had was reading mm -hmm. yeah and and they had long hours where that they had to fill and so the the um experience of reading a book was a much more um relaxing experience and they had a lot more time for it and they didn't have as many things pulling at their attention and now modern readers don't want to invest that much time into learning about all of the scenery because like you said, they know what things look like more easily, but also they could just turn on the television and see the picture instead of having to build it in their mind through long descriptions. So yeah, the, the, the readers today are different than those from like a century or two centuries ago. And but, it's yeah. genre to genre as well, because high fantasy mm -hmm. and science fiction readers can be very different to other genres. Yeah. And they... So, I mean, that's why in fantasy you can get away with more description and elaborate writing because the, everything is so new and people mm -hmm. want to be immersed in this world. So I think it's important for writers to be aware of what genre they're writing in. Yeah. Yeah. Another question someone asked is, do you need your inciting incident to start in the first chapter? You don't have to um, necessarily. You can look at the inciting incident as needing to happen in the first at some people say it that way but for me that inciting incident is um the hook of the story and i don't want to give my readers a chance to get bored and put the book down mm -hmm. so i want it to come as quickly as possible and and what you have to do before you create that inciting incident is you have to establish and introduce where your characters are and where they're going and what their life looks like when the story opens well enough that when that inciting incident comes in and changes everything, the reader is going to care. Mm -hmm. Inciting incidents don't matter or don't aren't as compelling if <clears throat> the reader doesn't know why they matter or mm -hmm. how big of a change they are. Yep, so you, have, I agree. you have to introduce enough of the character just before and what they're living for, working at, going through, that you care and get why that inciting incident is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say in romance, first three chapters, definitely. By the third chapter, if you haven't done your inciting incident in romance, then you're putting way too much backstory or whatever. Um, yep. in, in fantasy, you maybe can take it a little bit longer than that. I don't know. But um, Definitely with romance, keep it in the first three chapters. I'm just trying to figure out why you wouldn't. How would you get the care, the reader to want to turn the page to the next chapter? I think sometimes people just get too invested in building up yeah. to the inciting incident, like too much introduction, too much backstory. But there has to be, like inside of each chapter, there's inciting incidences just in that little scene. You know, so like which inciting incident are you talking about? You're talking about like that scene. Like, for example, a girl's getting fired from her job. That would be an inciting incident for her walking out, you know, with her stuff. Maybe the inciting incident of the story is her getting into the cab of her future. You know, and that can happen in different chapters where it's the story incident. But I think you're talking about the, the main story incident. So like every scene or chapter should reflect the same structure of your overall story. Mm -hmm. What Amy's talking about, but if we're talking about like the story inside the incident, then it you have to understand that a, a story is all about a character's forward projection being knocked off course by something. Your computer plugged in or it's gonna die. Where's your, where's your power cord? It's in my bedroom on my desk. Okay, on the left side, on the floor, in a power strip. So <laughs> something comes in and like knocks that character off onto the course of the story. Okay. Yep. 
So throughout the story, they'll be pursuing goals and being, and the conflict is going to knock them off course again. But it's like where they're going in the beginning and what knocks them into another path. And that path is the story you're telling. So that's what your inciting incident is. And it might be your meet cute, but yeah. you have to have a humdinger of a setup for that meet cute to actually be your inciting incident. Most of the time, I think that um, meet cute is the setup for the inciting incident. It's what like is what makes the inciting incident possible or makes it happen. If that makes sense. So like if yeah, I just I, I tend to think the meet cute is the setup for the inciting incident because it's the you get the introduction to the female character, possibly the male character, and then they meet up in some cute, sparkly, fiery you know, combustible something way, whatever that is, it's that dynamic between them that we call the meet cute, right? It's what sets up their dynamic as a romantic couple. And then in a romance, all of the conflict is to keep that romance from happening. So the inciting incident actually brings in the conflict of the story that's going to both push them together and push them apart. So the meet cute doesn't necessarily fulfill the inciting incident in most cases, so I guess it could, but I really think it's with that because in romance, I don't think you can have an inciting incident without the meet cute having happened. Yeah, I agree. Unless it's like do letters. <laughs> <laughs> or like an engagement that they don't want that was out of their control, maybe. Yeah. So someone asked about theme. So why don't you tell us about theme, Michelle? <laughs> Everybody knows I was like, let's talk about theme today. Okay, I love theme because theme eliminates story structure for me. And it eliminates what I'm doing with my whole entire premise and my character's motivation. So theme is the truth that you want your readers to walk away with, but it's also the truth that your character has to discover by the end of the story. It's, the, it's a universal truth that all people will, like, connect with. Um, that can be a lot of things. It can be, like, um, power corrupts righteousness. Or, you know, like... Um, Laura, I muted you because we are getting echoey. So if you're wondering why I muted you, that's why. <laughs> oh, and then, yeah, yeah, there you go. If you want to mute, there's just, like, we can hear ourselves <laughs> talking twice. Oh, uh, sorry. That's weird. There so we um, then we have what builds into your story structure. Your backstory creates um, the struggles that bring your reader to a state of believing a lie. A li the lie of the story might be something like, I am not good enough for, I'm not good enough to um, take over my father's business. Okay. That could be your character's lie. And the backstory has presented all of these situations to them that reinforces that lie over and over again that makes it become their belief, okay? Now, their goal in the story might be that I'm going to find what I am good at or something like that, right? And the truth of the story, the universal truth or the theme of what they're going is that... Um, you can do whatever you set your heart to. Let's say that's what your theme is, right? So she believes that she currently could not be successful in her father taking over her father's business. But the truth is you can do whatever you set your heart to doing, right? So that's the lie and that's the truth. The theme is universal, that all of us can do what we really, really want to do if we work hard enough for it, right? Okay, so that's the, the theme. Now the conflict comes in and creates an obstacle Okay, not conflict yet. Shoo, shoo, conflict. Mm. So then we have whatever your inciting incident is, is going to make it to where she's not pursuing this other path to finding something she can be successful at, but it's something that's going to make her have to take over her father's business, right? So the inciting incident is saying, whatever your lie is that you think can't happen, the story is about forcing you to make that happen anyway. So her father has a sudden heart attack, let's say. 
and the company's in turmoil and he's left it to her and she has no other choice but to step into her father's shoe even though she believes that there's no way she can be successful at it right so that's the inciting incident that propels her down this path towards discovering the truth of the story the conflict is going to come in and keep knocking her down and making her feel like her belief is right that she's not going to be successful and you as an author are going to work this magic of every time she gets knocked down during the course of the story she's actually going to learn something and it's going to make her better it's going to make her stronger it's going to set her up for when she gets to that black moment when she feels like she's been an utter failure and everything's fallen apart that she's going to have that moment of truth at the end of your story that is the moment when your theme is fully illuminated for the reader where your character discovers the truth is no i believe in this i've learned enough i've become competent because of all my failures so now i know that since i truly want to be successful at this i can make it happen and then they gather up their strength and they go off into the final battle which is where we have the climax of the story so that's how I would illuminate theme is that it's what you want your character to learn about themselves and you want the reader to walk away with and everything else should be interconnected with that theme so that your story can be resonant and powerful. So there you go. Now I'll shut up. <laughs> I hope I was good at describing that. You were good. You were good. Okay. Sorry, I, like, I had to answer my son. <laughs> I had somebody texting me for food. I'm like, okay, just a minute. You're going to have to wait. <laughs> All right. No, that was great about theme. And you touched on the lie and the truth because someone asked for examples for that. So you did that, which is fantastic. Um, and let's move on to the next one, which is compelling and believable dialogue. How to write dialogue. That's a whole class in of itself, isn't it? <laughs> I've also taught class on dialogue. I've been to a lot of great ones. It's yes. How much there is to it. There's a lot to it. I think the biggest thing I could say is that the less is more. You don't have to write realistic dialogue where you would put all the likes and ums and things inside of there. There's a lot that can be said through body language. There's a lot that can be said with context, what they're doing, how they're standing. Um, it's kind of like war writing a, what, like a, like a battle scene. You know, you don't need to write this person walked over there and this person did this. Like a lot can be interpreted through the eyes of the person who is viewing it. Um, so that would probably be my, my most Yeah. Helpful yeah. tip, I guess. Yeah. In a short period of time that we have to talk about dialogue. Yeah, we don't have a lot of time. My helpful tip is some people say go into public place and listen to what people are saying. But that to me is just too real life and you don't want to actually write like that. So my tip is to listen to the dialogue in TV and movies because they are really dialogue driven. Um, if you look at a screenplay, it's mostly just dialogue, right? So study that, study screenplays, study what people are saying in movies and TV, because that is, um, that is really important for how dialogue works in the story world that we live in, not in the real world, because in the real world, people go off on tangents and all this and it uh, gets what? all muddled. Yeah. <laughs> Not you, never. No. <laughs> I'm very clear and concise when I speak. <laughs> but I think also too, like stay away from rehashing things that the character should already know. Yes. Um, and don't rehash things that just happened. Like we talk about scene and sequel, right? You have a lot of action and then you have downtime. And there's like people describe it as like sit around the kitchen table to kind of discuss, but you don't need to go into detail about what the reader just experienced. Exactly. It has to be new stuff, new information. And stay away from like, oh my gosh, did you like to, to talk about a divorce? Did you hear that so-and-so got a divorce? If your character already knows that, like they just, you know, like you got to stay yeah. away from that type, that thing too, to use dialogue to pad or give information when you can. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. You don't want to, as you know, as you know, Bob, moments where <laughs> as you already know well, this but i'm going to tell you want, anyway fun character to write and and she she said, your mother died last sunday 
<laughs> what about you, Laura? Yeah, what do you have for us? Um, I would say um, specifically writing dialogue instead of being like, hey there, he said quietly or in a quiet voice to the child, you know, instead say, you know, Kevin crouched low to Sally as she was under the table and said, hey there, you know, just kind of make it a bit more fluid in your writing and less about, hi, he said, hello, she said quietly, how are mm -hmm. you? <laughs> you know, it's yes. just, and also, yes, just following what you were, what you were saying, Vitrine, that if you actually did make it like real life, like me and my sisters have the most awkward conversations ever, like, especially when you're tired, you just be yes. like, hey, you're right. Yeah. Hang on a minute. So, <laughs> like, uh -huh. it's rather aimless, right? Yeah. And in the story, they have to do a job. Like if they're just talking and it doesn't matter, it doesn't move the story forward in any way. Like it doesn't matter. Like half of the things I talk about in a day wouldn't matter for anything, you know, but in a story, anything anybody says has to do something, reveal mm -hmm. character, push the story forward, foreshadow something or, or reveal backstory. You know, those are major um, tools that we use dialogue for. And if it's not doing any of those things, then cut the dialogue. Yeah. And okay. along with what Laura said, like she's talking a lot about using action dialogue tags. Um, I actually like to build in a varied um, array of dialogue tags, because I think if you do too much of anything, then it gets really clunky. Um, and confusing. Some writers like to write with no dialogue tags or all action tags or all like he said, she said, or he amused and she, um, you know, spewed. <laughs> <laughs> the writer brain is working Spew today. should be in a romance. Please put <laughs> that in there. Like you should just make it all mixed up and do what feels right in the scene. Like what is most effective because sometimes a simple he said is the most in a, a like unobtrusive way to keep the reader aware of who's saying what. Didn't you say you were listening to an audiobook and they literally just went from character back and back and forth and at one point you were like, I don't even know who's but talking. Yeah, because there were like three or four people in the room. And you couldn't follow who was you who. You couldn't follow who's who, even with the action tags, because the action tags, you didn't know who's action all the time they were connected to. Oh, yeah. And so that's, that's and when a reader and an audiobook artist is reading it, they can't change their voice that much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you've got yeah. three men talking in a room and you keep saying he, you know, scratched his head, what do you mean? Like, uh -huh. it like, it could be like, I don't know what you're doing over there. He scratched his head. You know, like, what? what Who scratched his head, his head at what point? And like, I don't know tell me which man. <laughs> That, you know, so like, just like, it's another, it's another dynamic we have to think about as authors since we do um, audiobooks. It's like, yeah. And, and you know, sometimes you do like, um, like Victorine has been using um, uh, technology to create some audiobooks. So you're not even going to have like a real person making decisions. Yes. So that, that adds another element to that. So my, my tip about dialogue that a lot of people don't think about very much is that mm, the way we talk to people changes depending on our relationship to them mm -hmm. and, and what situation we're in. So <clears throat> like if you're talking to your boss, you're going to talk one way compared to if you're talking to your brother or mm -hmm. if you're talking to your best friend or if you're talking to your girlfriend, like all of those relationships are going to change. Are you at a funeral? Are you at the mall? Are you in your living room? Are you in your bedroom? Like all of those things are going to impact the way your character speaks and how they interact with other people. But at the same time, it has to be true to that character. I'm telling you, dialogue is not easy because you want your character's voice to maintain, reckon, to be recognizable, right? And not in the sense that you, you know, they're a Southern accent, so you write it so that the way it sounds, but then it ends up just being really weird to yeah. read it. But that each of your characters has a recognizable voice. Yes. And that's very, very hard to do. So write your is. perfect is what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> we're saying do the impossible. But yeah. <laughs> one of my favorite, favorite tips for editing dialogue is that if you feel like you've lost the voice of a character or your editor tells you that, that your character is inconsistent, just go through 
and edit one character's dialogue at a time. Mm -hmm. And then it's so much easier to tell if your character's voice is, is consistent and distinguishable than if you're constantly mixing it up with everybody else's. That's a good idea. I love that. Yeah, All right. Our last one for today is how to incorporate backstory without info dumping. Okay. I have a few tips on this too. I told Victory before we started that I wrote some notes on some things. Oh, because I want it to be concise and I'm to talk. <laughs> okay. Backstory, we all know, should is best delivered in pieces, in like bits and pieces instead of like in big chunks. But there's two things you have to think about with that. The first one is what do they oh that's my dad. I got it. This has been a very active podcast. Fun day. <laughs> I know. We are just like having like this is real life. This is life. Guys. We yeah. have real life. So, anyways, so backstory should be delivered in pieces, and it's the ones that the reader needs to know. Then, like, don't give them anything if they don't need to know it at that exact moment in the story, right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise. You're just filling their heads with stuff and their brains are already being just filled with all this new stuff and they're having to make choices about what they pay attention to. So you want them to pay attention to what they need to know right then. And then my next one is back to what I said at the beginning, that all readers are basically in this from the mystery of it. They mm -hmm. want to ask questions and they want to figure it out for themselves. If you, if you can't give your reader the credit to understand that they're smart and that they know how to find clues and put the pieces together, then you're going to end up dumping a whole lot of information on them because you don't trust them as a reader. Okay. So you have to treat this as if you're a mystery writer and you are leaving them all the clues that they need to answer your story questions, right? Your backstory is full of clues that they need to learn about your character, to learn about their motivations, to figure out why they're making the choices that they're making. And so, so much of the backstory that you can weave in can be dropped in specific moments as clues. And I think if we make that, that switch in our head to thinking about like, I'm giving them information to I am teasing them with clues and slowly leading them along the path, then it kind of changes the way you you feed it to them right mm -hmm. you're a lot more um what's the word i'm like I'm not picky but like um selective selective yes Here, choosy about what you give them and so it helps you to really avoid those big dumps of information so like um like in my bodyguard romance that i wrote this last summer i had a big twist kind of thing that I was trying to reveal by the end of the story. And um, it was all about her relationship with somebody else in the story. And I could have just fed them all of that information at the beginning of the story. So you knew who she was and why she was scarred the way she was and why she was making the choices she was. But part of the joy of that story was the reader going, why is she doing this? Why, why, you know, and then you just keep giving her little information, like little pieces of her backstory. So they're like, Oh, 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 that's what you want your reader to do all the way through the story. And so I would leave like one of the, the scenes that happened is this um, Senator comes in and he's interacting with his daughter. And my main character goes, he always likes to make everyone think he's the perfect family man. And it's just a thought that she has. But it's a backstory clue, right? And and then you, the reader starts to go, she was kind of snarky about that. Like, what what's going on? Is he not a family man? Why doesn't she think he's a good family man? And it, so you're just making your reader ask these questions because you've started dropping these backstory clues. And the more you learn about their relationship as the story goes on in just these little tiny bits and pieces, her backstory is being revealed as you need to have it. Absolutely. Love that. That's exactly what I do too. What about you, Laura? I would say timing as well. I have a really good example of a bad example. <laughs> 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 I can only really think of like times I mess up. So um, 
<laughs> in Queen of Snow, a co-written project I have with Jesse Cal. Um, it, one, it was one of my chapters and it was an action scene. And we've learned very quickly, her strengths are action, mine are not. My <laughs> strengths are more like the lovely flowery world building and you know the emotions anyway so there's they're in a castle there's guards he's fighting people our snow queen is coming down the staircase there's ice shooting out her hands you know it's a very kind of like high adrenaline scene and then <laughs> so embarrassing <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> he's in the middle of the scene fighting and then he looks in the <laughs> sky he sees a piano <laughs> and then I go into a really long paragraph about how he loved to play the piano <laughs> and Jesse was like Laura <laughs> it's an action scene we didn't need to know all about how oh when I was young my grandfather sat me down <laughs> with the piano it was so bad so there is a time and place for backstory it's not during an action scene but as a good example not of mine of course is when somebody has been having an argument and then the main character behaves in a really exaggerated way or, or an unexpected way and they're like whoa why did they take such offense or why do they react that way then in the next scene as they're kind of calming down and thinking about it that's when you can insert maybe they had an abusive mother that used to say the exact same thing and that person just triggered her so I'm trying to say time and places so that your pacing isn't dragging or you know <gasps> Oh, was hard work. Yes, I love it. <laughs> How is like when you use secondary characters to reveal backstory too? Yeah, like where you can't have your character say, "Well, so you keep telling all of mine." <laughs> Take over. <laughs> She's like, I'm, "I wrote it down so I could be really fast," and then she, <laughs> and then hey. she mutes me right before I speak. So I'm just like, uh, <laughs> yeah, "I was just joking." Go ahead. No. The <laughs> No, seriously. No, like the thing is, is like I always do this when I was watching shows. Sorry, my dog is barking, so I'll be really fast. Like I you can't have your character say, Oh yes, my mother was a financial banking wizard and that meant she never had time to raise me as a child. You know, you can't like that's but if he there's an argument, something's weird, and then the main character leaves the room. Like if you're like, it's not their point of view. You can have multiple POV characters. And then a secondary character tells the POV, POV character, well, his mother was never there for them because she was always too busy with work. You know, mm -hmm. like you can reveal like, like, like a Watson. Like you don't have to worry about subtext as much if a secondary character is the one revealing the backstory. If it's the main character, you can't be so on the nose with it. But a secondary character, you really can a little bit yeah. more not like go on and on and on and on but you can be like really straightforward with stuff yep I, and i also think um the harry potter hermione yes. situation is also really good when you have someone who knows nothing about the world like harry potter knew nothing about any of this fantasy world but hermione she had studied everything and so she always had the answers so anytime he had a question hermione was the one he went to and she would explain it all to him and that's a great way to incorporate um telling the reader about backstory without um making it big long info dumps of um paragraphs and stuff Okay, I would like to say something now. Go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna hold up like a, you know, if you, you go to uh, uh, Bubble Gump, you know, you can put the sign over like "Go Force, Go" or "Stop Force, Stop." I'm gonna just do that and just hold it up. Um, but I would, what I wanted to say was like using the other characters' actions or placement in the scene can really describe that person's. Um, backstory so like in, for example in my story finding love with the billionaire um she is a uh she's a news uh, she she's a journalist and so I, there was a lot of opportunities where i could have info dumped because she would have read articles like i read an article that said he did this and i read an article that said he did that but instead she goes in thinking she's going to get this like piece of the year she's going to get a pulitzer all these things and then she finds out no i have to write a fluff piece about this billionaire and so she gets in there and she's just like noting like how uncomfortable he looks and then as he's talking, he's slowly like taking off his jacket and he's taking, well, this, not that kind of look, but he's just kind of like loosening wow. his tie 
guy and he's on. So by the end of the scene, he's literally like just a guy in a white shirt and pants. So I signified to, I know, like that is like, like, you know, we're, we're going steamy now. No. But like, that was a signifying that this was not where he wanted to be. This is not where he felt comfortable. And so as a reader, you're like, okay, obviously, you know, you would think a billionaire rich guy is where he wants to be. You know, he loves the limelight. Obviously, this is not who he wants to be. My other billionaire one, he ends up, she's in the kitchen. She thinks that he is like the, uh, like the helper for the chef. So she's just like ragging on the billionaire, you know, the guy who's his birthday parties for, she's like who gets birthdays thrown. He's like 30 something, like get over yourself. And he's just kind of listening to her. And, and then at the end of the story, you find out, she finds out that he's actually the guy that the party is for, but as a reader, you're intrigued. You're like, well, why would he be in the kitchen? And why would he pretend that he was this, you know, helper? And why wouldn't he say, so you can do a lot of that sort of thing in the story without actually like having to, you know, the character, the main girl character would be like, oh, well, I read this story about him. And I read that story about him. You know, you can really yeah. use the character themselves through the eyes yeah. of the other character to describe how that person's backstory is. What are you doing? Oh, <laughs> anyways, that's what I wanted to say. Go for us, go. Good. <laughs> awesome. All right. We have more tips for you on craft. We have more um, questions, but we don't have enough time today. So we'll answer them next week. Uh, we'll go over flaws and strengths for your characters. We'll talk about inner goals and outer goals and how they relate to plot points. We'll talk about kissing scenes because we know everybody wants to know about kissing scenes. <laughs> oh, in other words, the good stuff is next week. <laughs> good stuff is next week. And how to make characters readers fall in love with. So we'll talk all about that next week. So don't miss our next week. Be sure to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss. If we get and enough subscribers, maybe we can you know, afford to buy a studio and plane tickets to fly together and record this so we don't have that's like, right. <laughs> I kind of like the real life. I kind of do too. Isn't that brand, right? Chaos. <laughs> All right, you guys have a great week and we'll join you again next week. And be sure to join our Facebook group if you're not a part of it. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.